computers can solve the simplest of problems and the most complex problems in the universe. The universe is an utterly complex place governed by the laws of physics. But luckily, to try to wrap our minds around this, we, uh, we can use the power of the largest supercomputers in the world. And not only supercomputers can help us, our minds can help us, and also the world's largest telescopes can help us as well, gathering light beyond what we can actually see, all the way out to the observable edge of the universe. But what did human, humankind see in the ancient times? And in dark sky, you would see something like this. Beautiful dust lanes and dots of points of light in the sky. But if you had a lot of time just to, to ponder what was going on, you can ask these questions. What are these shining points of light? Where did this light come from? When did it form? And how did it form? And the ancients also saw wandering points of light also, and those are known as planets. And so they thought about why they actually wandered. And they came up with all these theories of how planets actually moved around the sun, or in that time, the sun was orbiting around our Earth. We've come a long way since those ancient times, and we're still building upon these theories. And so how did the Milky Way actually form our host, gal our host galaxy? So if we can magically go outside of our Milky Way, we would see something like this. We've gathered a lot of data. Astronomers and astrophysicists have gathered a lot of data trying to understand the origins and the structure of the Milky Way. Now you see these grand spiral design galaxies like this, dotted with new stars forming along dust lanes. I mean, it's just gorgeous to look at. I mean, astronomy is a very visual science. And we want to understand how these galaxies actually form. Now, this galaxy here, this is 120 million light years away, really distant, distant away, but it's only a fraction of the observable universe away. And we're going to take a journey to the very edges of the observable universe in this talk. So if you have a keen eye here, you can see there are some tiny galaxies in the background. Now, astronomers have actually gathered data from these galaxies and measured their velocities. And they are indeed be, uh, in the background of this galaxy. They're not in the same regions, but they're in the background. And theories of galaxy formation, trying to understand how these complex entities form over billions of years, we have to understand how the laws of physics work at very large scales, all the way down to atomic scales, because everything's important in this regime. And we have tremendous tools orbiting around our Earth and around the sun, these space probes. And one spectacular one is uh, observatory is Hubble. Actually, this month marks the 25th anniversary of Hubble's launch. I mean, it's tremendous to even think about. It's been in orbit for 25 years when it's only been scheduled to be in life. Its lifetime was 15 years. And what's even more thought-provoking is that you know, it's still surviving even without the shuttle to actually help it throughout its, uh, its uh, old age. So what are we actually looking at here? This is the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. This is, if you take Hubble, point it at some, one of the darkest points in the sky, and you just open the shutter for a total of three weeks. This is what it'll see. And how big is this? Look, how big is this field of view? So I have a dime here. If I hold this dime at arm's length and look at FDR's eye, this is how big this field of view actually is. And what's actually in this field of view is almost all galaxies. There are almost 10,000 galaxies in this field of view. There are only a couple stars here. This is one of the darkest points in the sky. Now, we can, we can zoom around this field of view and actually look at the, all the different morphologies, the different sizes, the different colors of all these galaxies. You can see they come in all shapes and sizes, in all colors. And we want to try to understand, you know, we're looking at snapshots of these galaxies, frozen in time. And we have to piece together all of this information to try to understand our origins of our own Milky Way, our own Sun, and our own Earth. So, I'm going, to try to I'm going to explain what we just looked at and how astrophysicists and astronomers try to disentangle all of this information and to complete theories of galaxy formation. So first, we can't just sit back and watch a galaxy evolve. That'll take millions, even billions of years. I mean, that's impossible, but luckily, 
astronomers are time travelers. So let's look at this. Well, let me explain this. So if you were to go outside on this nice sunny day and look at the sun, oh, wait, don't look at the sun. You'd get actually blinded. But if you just feel the warmth from the sun, those photons, that light that left the sun, that left the, light, that left the sun eight minutes ago. It takes eight minutes for photons to travel from the, earth, from the sun to our own Earth. Now we can take this to a more personal level. Now I suppose, theoretically, we can observe a, a baby girl 100 light years away. So the, these, this light that's reflected off this baby takes a finite, has a finite speed of light. So it actually travels at the speed of light, but it takes time. So those, that light is reflected off the baby, but as this light is traveling toward us, the girl is aging. She's living a full and fruitful life, and so eventually, as this light comes to us, she's 100 years old. So we're, look, we have this snapshot of, 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 this, uh, of this woman when she was a baby, but now she is 100 years old. And this is just because the speed of light travels at, at some finite limit of speed. So that's it, around 186,000 miles per second. So it's extremely fast. And so let's take this to an even more extreme example. Not 100 light years, but billions of light years across observable universe. And just to see what we're looking at in the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, this is what we're looking at, this pencil beam through the universe. So here are all of these galaxies and our local universe. And we look throughout the whole universe, deeper and deeper and deeper. Now you're looking at 1 billion years and 10 billion years back into the past. And we can look at all these galaxies all the way up down to the edge of the observable universe. This is where galaxies start their lives, 13.8 billion years ago. So it's very hard to actually peer from the very top of this column where we actually exist all the way back 13.8 billion light years away. Now there is an inherent there's an inherent difficulty of looking at faint objects or distant objects. Why is this? We're all familiar with this. It's called the inverse square, light, or square law of light. So we can take a candle and just move it, move it further and farther back. It gets dimmer and dimmer. This is the same thing that happens with galaxies. If we want to see what are the first galaxies in the universe, they're going to be very far away and thus very dim. But luckily we have, we have the world's largest telescopes and the world's largest supercomputers at our aid. So it's just started to build, they've just started to build some of the largest telescopes 30 meters across, or that's 100 feet. And it's huge, just imagine how big that is. I can, I'm lucky if I can kick a football across 30 meters, right? And, but we have, but that's not my realm. I've actually, I'll be honest, I've never actually touched a big telescope like this. I've never used it. I wouldn't trust myself with one of these. But my realm is with computers or supercomputers. These have nearly a million cores. I mean, you have a handful of cores in your tablets, your phones, and your personal computers. But we have a million cores at our, at our use at, at, to actually use for any problem that we would like. And we use this to study the universe, how galaxies form. And computers are tools. Computers won't do they won't actually perform anything on by themselves. We have to program them. We are digital architects. We actually have to put the effort into the into actual coding to actually tell the computer what to do, what equations to solve, how to actually evolve this in time. And there are many ingredients that goes into middle many physical ingredients that goes into one of these computer codes, millions of lines of code, years of effort and testing. So some, a handful of these physical processes are, gra are, one is gravity, that actually, we're all familiar with gravity that tracks mass together. We have radiation, radiation that, that is emitted from stars and gas and heats the surrounding regions. This is what we feel. We feel the infrared heat from the sun as it hits our body. And we have cosmology. Cosmology describes the universe as a whole and how it actually expands after the Big Bang. We have magnetism. We're familiar with magnetism by using compasses or actually playing with bar magnets, and this affects the motion of charged particles. And we have quantum mechanics on the very smallest level. This dictates how atoms behave and cool, and this is very important in, in actually forming stars. 
And lastly, what I've put up here is chemistry. Chemistry tells us how these atoms actually interact with each other to form complex molecules that we actually observe in most places in the universe. And now we have all these ingredients in our code. Now, how do we start it? We always, whenever you have a problem to solve, you need initial conditions. How do we actually start this? So if you look anywhere in the night sky, if we had a micro, in, in microwaves, we see just radiation in microwaves everywhere in the sky. Where is this coming from? This was actually the product of two physics Nobel Prizes. Uh, the first thing that you look at is just this fuzz of microwave, or a microwave radiation. Where did this come from? This is actually a relic of the Big Bang. The radiation was traveling away from when the universe was first transparent. This is what we're looking at. This is when the universe was first transparent to light. In the beginning, light and matter were coupled together, and the universe, as it's expanding, it becomes den less dense and less dense, and the, then the light can actually travel away. And this is what we're seeing, when the universe was only 380,000 years old. It's, an, it's a picture of the baby universe. And this is little fluctuations in density and temperature on one part in 100,000. These are tiny. You wouldn't even be able to see this, like fluctuations in like the carpet. I mean, it's much smaller, but what these things are, these, these, these over densities, these, these places where you have a little bit more dense regions than other places, they're the seeds of galaxy formation, the seeds of everything that we see today. And everything grew from the gravity from these over dense places. Now, we have these initial conditions, and we have our code to actually run it. Now we can actually determine how galaxies actually form and match these with observations. Now I'm going to, here I show, this is a simulation that my collaborators and I performed uh, a few years ago, and this shows the galaxies forming. So we're looking at a few million light years across over five billion years of evolution. And all you see are stars, these galaxies doing cosmic dances around each other as gravity pulls them together, and you get the collisions, you get shock waves happening, which then go on to form stars, these pink blasts, these, this is where stars are actually forming. And they're just dancing around over millions and billions of years, forming stars all the time. And here, it just continues for cosmic time. And this be repeats and repeats and repeats until you get a massive collision like this, and you form even more stars. And, and this repeats many, many times. I mean, hundreds of times. The, all these different mergers, all the smooth accretion, all the smooth growth on galaxies. Eventually, you get something like this. This is M81. This is one of the brightest galaxies in the sky. And you get this majestic structure like this. And we want to explain. This is how we explain and understand how these galaxies form. In the actual, in the actual, you know, the collision, and in the actual uh, collisions, and understand the physics over billions of years to actually simulate billions of years in a few months of computer time. Now, if you were to run that computer simulation on your personal computer, that would take nearly 10 million years, and we have to actually think how to how to actually parallelize and make this very efficient to run on these supercomputers and to produce and understand a galaxy like this, or any galaxy in the night sky. Now, if we, let's go back to the night sky. Let's go back to the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the extreme deep field. And we say, how does this faint galaxy actually look like? It's only a smudge, but there's a lot of information in this light. We can actually take this light and stretch it into a spectrum, and actually understand what stars are creating this light, and what kind of gas is creating this light, and match models to this, this spectrum. And this is another one of my simulations that I've done. And this is a dwarf galaxy, what's known as a dwarf galaxy. It's a, a thousand times less massive than the Milky Way. It's much smaller only when, the gal only when the universe was one billion years old. Now that's a long time, but that's a very short period of time in 13.8 billion years. So hundreds of these galaxies, different galaxies, these dwarf galaxies, they merge together to go on to form the Milky Way. Now I want to go back to just the telescopes and computers. It's really, I mean, it's, there's sub, subfields within astronomy and astrophysics, and we feed on each other. It's a feedback loop. We learn something. We gather new observations from the largest telescopes. 
And then we have to try to understand what's going on in these new observations. It may be a new discovery, and then the theorists with their pencil and paper or computers actually try to understand this. And, it's, and it goes on and on. It's this feedback loop, trying to understand the universe. Now, I just want to end with the night sky. It's number one. It's beautiful if you ever get the chance of going out to not dark sky, in like in the North Georgia mountains or in Utah or Arizona. I highly recommend it and see a spectacular sight like this. But the ancients have, we have come a long way since the ancients asking what, where, when, and how. And now, just in the last decade or even century, we've come a long way to trying to understand the mysteries of the universe using the world's largest telescopes and supercomputers. Thank you.